Hello, podcast audience. Just came to my attention uh, a wonderful thing that is happening to help those who have suffered during the recent natural disasters. A good friend of mine uh, who himself experienced a flood that really derailed homeschooling for a while is uh, he works for Celebrate Kids, Kathy's organization, and they have established a network at homeschoolrelief.org. The purpose of which is to bring help to homeschooling families who have lost curriculum in fires, floods, uh, most recently tornadoes in Kentucky, um, and connecting those people who lost curriculum with the curriculum providers so that uh, we can replace what was lost as a contribution. And we've been doing this uh, for several years with HSLDA's Compassion and on our own, but uh, this looks like a, a great way for us all to network together. So if you are someone who could offer help, or if you are someone who could use help, or if you know someone who has suffered and needs help, then please do visit homeschoolrelief.org. That's all one word, homeschoolrelief.org, and you'll see, um, in addition to us, uh, the many wonderful organizations that have signed on to create this uh, support network for those who will be in a time of need. The Christmas stories would always kind of cycle around. As an adult with kids, I read the book pretty much every year, which was Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So Merry Christmas, Andrew. Almost. Almost, yes. It's not very often that we can confidently say when we know a certain podcast that we're recording a little bit before December 22nd is actually coming out on December 22nd. Which is still before Christmas. Well, technically, yes, it's true. It's true. But I thought it would be fun for our listeners, for you and I just to have a conversation about holiday traditions, what perhaps what we grew up with ourselves and what we did with our children and what we do now that we don't have any children at home. Well, okay. I'm just curious how this is connected with what we normally do, talking about the arts of language. Well, I do believe that some holiday traditions very closely tie into listening, speaking, reading, writing, and maybe even thinking. Yeah, and we could add in singing. And singing. <laughs> well, there you go. Right. And so let's let's just start right there. What were what were some of your holiday traditions as a boy growing up in Southern California where it never snows? <laughs> well, my mother um was a music teacher, mm-hmm. piano and voice. So it was a long road of practicing mm. Christmas music. Sure. For the Christmas recital. Mm-hmm. And it may or may not have contributed to some of my difficulty being cheerful at Christmas in mm-hmm. my whole life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but certainly I got a lot of music in my ears. And uh, one of the jobs that I had probably from, I don't know, 9, 10, 11, that zone, seemed like many years, although it probably wasn't. I was in charge of the refreshments oh. for the recital. Okay. So while all of my mother's students would go up and sing or play, I got to busy myself arranging the cookies on the tray. Oh, nice. <laughs> and preparing the punch, which, of course, had to be holiday-hued. Right. And I just am, in retrospect, profoundly grateful for the responsibility she gave me because just sitting in music recitals, listening to all of those pieces was really hard. Well, and that you had already heard 
umpteen times. Um, yeah, umpteen hundred over the years. <laughs> uh, it seemed like every year, several of the students all had to sing something from a mall and the night visitors. I don't know what this is. You don't. It was I don't know, it was like a musical or mm. kind of a collection of songs that told a story. Of oh, nice. The, the Christmas story. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and um, I guess I think Amal was maybe a kid where the mm. wise men stopped by looking okay. for where they were going to. Or Link in the show notes for I, this story. I don't story. really we'll remember. I this. just remember the songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, not even the words anymore. Just mm-hmm. the melodies stick behind Right, uh, but that uh, that Christmas recital seemed to be always coinciding with the the last day of school mm-hmm. for what seemed like hopefully a long time, mm-hmm. and the lead up to Christmas morning. Christmas morning. Yeah. So I actually spent my childhood, the wonder years, you know, ages one through twelve, where it did snow. I was born and raised in Minnesota. Mm. And moved to California when I was a teenager. And so we had plenty of snow and plenty of hot chocolate. And I remember a lot of festivities that we did as a family visiting Dayton's, which is a a department store in downtown Minneapolis. Mm. And they would decorate the windows with all these elves, characters. Macy's would do something like that in L.A. Right, right. And that was always a highlight. And then we also very much enjoyed going out and looking at Christmas lights all bundled up. Of course, you can do that anywhere pretty much in the United States, seeing the beautiful light displays. And that was a big part. But But there's something about the light displays in the snow Mm -hmm. that is particular. Right, yeah. So you never had to sing that song, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. It was just like, inevitable, there will be a white Christmas. Oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely in Minnesota. (laughs) If if it's not a white Christmas, there's something going on there. But certainly, because we moved when I was a teenager, I still have fond memories of Mm -hmm. white Christmases. And occasionally we here in the Tulsa area do get white Christmases, which is... An unexpected treat for yes. us. Yeah. Yes. Usually it's just too cold and doesn't snow. So the Christmas stories mm-hmm. would always kind of cycle around, a mall in the night visitors being one of those. Right. And I don't remember specifically either of my parents reading the book. I think we watched some version of the movie, but as an adult with kids, I read the book pretty much every year, mm-hmm. which was Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol. And in fact... Subtitled, A Ghost Story. Oh, is that right? Yes. <laughs> yes, in fact, uh, one of the things that we've talked about in a previous podcast was the movie about Charles Dickens and right. how he wrote mm-hmm. the story. So, The Man Who Invented Christmas. Yeah, I, that all just flashed back into my mind right now. But mm-hmm. uh, I was uh, listening to a podcast, someone else's podcast, mm-hmm. yesterday, and he was trying to encourage everyone to read the Christmas Carol to their children, to their mm-hmm. family. And so he read little snippets of it. And, and I just thought, yep, I got to do that again. But yeah. The grandchildren are all a little bit on the young side for mm-hmm. such a long story. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but soon we'll get back in the room. And the other one I read many times to the kids when they were at home almost every year for quite a while was Skipping Christmas by John Grisham. Yes. Those are two of the stories that come to mind first Mm -hmm. when I think of the holiday season. Right, right. And, you know, living living in Minnesota and then moving to California, some traditions continued at my living at home years. Every year, this is before internet and before even VHS, we would look forward to the holiday Christmas specials, Charlie Brown Mm. Christmas and Frosty the Snowman. Yes, you had to have the TV guide Mm -hmm. and you had to mark Mm -hmm. in the TV guide and remind your parents so they wouldn't forget. Yes, I remember that. But And you mentioned the holiday music and there's, you know, those are, for the most part, those are musicals. And so you're hearing a lot of that music 
And so that just carries through. And that's the listening, Andrew. See, hearing and listening to the music and just having those fond memories. And I think also of the Christmas poems. I know you've talked about in the past your dad read the poetry. Did he have any special favorite Christmas poems? Well, um, obviously, A Visit from St. Nicholas is Mm -hmm. the the default. I, I can't right offhand think of any others. Can you? Well, if a visit from St. Nicholas is "Twas the night before Christmas." Yes, I believe that's, that's the name of the poem. <laughs> yes, that's ex- immediately what came to my mind as yeah. well. But there must be others too. Sure, sure, and uh, of course they all have varying themes of you know the sacred and the secular. We'll put we'll we'll gather a list of Christmas poems and put them in the show notes, and listeners can then perhaps read them aloud. I I think. What you and I are kind of overarching talking about is Christmas traditions. Mm-hmm. And it's so um, so interesting to me, some of the traditions that I did as a child growing up with my family, who we have a Swedish-German kind of background, uh, were carried on in our own raising our boys with the added mixture of my husband, who is half Japanese. And so we added in rice balls as a part of our Christmas oh. dinner, which my my husband would say, it's really no big deal. They're just rice balls, rice balls yeah. right? And there's actually a word for it in Japanese. I can't think of what that is. But because he had so few Christmas traditions growing up because of the dynamics of his family and not being necessarily Western culture, you know, Eastern culture, Western culture. I said, well, let's at least bring that part in. So my kids now, and this was the other thing we did when we decorated the Christmas tree, I always made my special homemade chili that I put in Italian sausage in the chili that time of year, and then we would serve that over rice. Oh, I was afraid you were going to be decorating the tree. No, 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 not decorating the tree. You would eat that That while you were decorating. Yeah, that was the meal. And so my son last year sent me a picture of a crock pot of chili that he was making as he was decorating the tree with his wife and kids, which I thought was very sweet. I guess the biggest change, and, and I didn't really bring a lot of particular traditions to our family. Mm-hmm. So mostly my wife was in charge of all that. And there are certain things that persist to this day, much to my chagrin, like these cranberry orange muffins. And I have to take all the skin. What do you call it? Zesting Zest. the orange. Oh, z- I love that. It smells things. so good. And uh, it seems like we have to do it twice, once at Thanksgiving and once at Christmas. <laughs> and Thanksgiving, I, I cut off a little edge of my <laughs> my knuckle zesting these oranges. So this Christmas, I'm determined that if I am assigned the task of doing this with the grater, I'm not going to shave off the same spot of my knuckle. Uh, but the big difference from childhood for us now is now we look at Advent differently. Mm. So we don't really... We, we try not to think the Christmas season starts right after Thanksgiving or mm. before in some horrible cases. But there's this period, uh, you know, which traditionally mm-hmm. in, in the ancient church uh, and still today in the apostolic churches continues as a period of penance, fasting, preparation. Mm-hmm. So then Christmas kind of happens and then that's the explosion of the joy and the celebration so when I was a kid, of course, we would go get the Christmas tree very early in December, keep it up until maybe New Year's, and then done. Mm-hmm. Whereas now we tend to get our Christmas tree right before Christmas, mm-hmm. which has advantage and disadvantage. Disadvantage, not so many good ones available, but, you know, I like a Charlie Brown tree anyway. <laughs> uh, advantage, they're all half price on mm-hmm. Christmas Eve at Lowe's. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, But that really was an interesting shift for me is to, okay, I'm not in this festive period until it happens. Mm -hmm. Then we have, you know, the big 12-day feast. And, of course, uh, I've influenced us here at IW Mm -hmm. with this 12 days of Christmas idea. Right. And so let me just give a little plug for that because I think it's appropriate. A lot of companies, Starbucks comes to mind. A few other companies do 12 days of Christmas 
12 days prior to Christmas ending on Christmas Day, Mm -hmm. we actually start our 12 days of Christmas giving. We call that 12 days of Christmas giving where we are giving gifts every day after Christmas up until 12 days. January 6th is the 12th day where we give away the biggest and best gift we can possibly come up with. There's a beautiful uh, entendre here because we have Epiphany Mm -hmm. is that day. Right. And nobody knows what the secret gift is. Right. So it's a gift. So it will be an epiphany. Well, and for our listeners that don't know Epiphany, the Feast of Epiphany. What is that? Well, there's there's two, mm-hmm. actually. In the Orthodox and Eastern churches, it was the doubling of the baptism as well mm-hmm. as the uh, – where, where the, you know, the Holy Spirit comes and said, this is my mm-hmm. beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So that mm-hmm. was the revealing to the world. Mm-hmm. And then it's also the Feast of the Wise Men right. who, who – the Christ is revealed mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. But the word epiphany means kind of unveiling or revealing. Right. And so... Trivia question for you. Yeah. And perhaps for our listeners, according to the Bible, how many wise men were there? Well, I'm sure it's not three, because if it were three, then that wouldn't be a trick question. It's true. It is a trick question, and it is not ever indicated exactly how many there were. Mm-hmm. Probably a lot more than three, but it there's could no have answer. been. And then their names, of course, are from, you know, ancient tradition mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is passed on. Yeah. So yeah. and and the other thing we we have wrong in our minds is that they probably weren't there when he was born, but maybe a couple years later. Possibly, yeah. Uh, so they probably weren't in the manger scene as it actually happened. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's a, a combination of Symbols and tradition mm-hmm. and meaning right. and richness that's all right. woven together as often, you know, we find things are. Right, right. So I just, we had mentioned a couple of read-alouds that you have done. I know that when our staff was smaller here at IEW, we would have annual Christmas parties. And one of the things that we looked forward to was you reading a Christmas, various Christmas stories to us. Yeah, I think Gift to the Magi. That's a good one, yep. I think one year I tried to read – there's a fascinating collection. It's all in one book. You can Mm -hmm. buy it. But it's letters written by J.R.R. Tolkien to his children each Christmas, only he signed them, I think, Santa Claus. Or Father Christmas, I think. Father Christmas, that's right. He signed them Father Christmas. And he he artistically did this kind of in a calligraphy with illuminated borders. It's a beautiful Mm -hmm. book. and. Uh, some of them are, I guess, quite poignant. Mm-hmm. So gift giving, how much? I know your your wife is a gift giver. She loves to give presents. We do something a little different in the Walker family. Mm-hmm. I'll just share real quick, and then you can share what you have, what it's grown to in your family. So I'm a mom of three boys, and they're all married. And so that often means that we potentially have the conflict of, who are you going to spend Christmas with, her parents or his right, parents? Right. And so we just said, hey, let's come up with this idea. We do something called Thanksmas, Thanks where we do a, a holiday celebration in between Thanksgiving and Christmas generally, and then we do gifts. And what my husband and I decided to do is just not make gift giving the big thing. It's more about family, doing activities together, trying to come up with some – like. This year, we went to Austin, Texas, and did Swimley. Have you heard of Swimley? Oh, you don't need to worry about Swimley. Swimley is where you can rent someone else's backyard pool, kind of like— Oh, like an Airbnb, but specifically for the swimming pool. with pools. Yeah, so our family went and, hang, and hung out at someone else's backyard pool and just had a delightful time. In, in November? Was the pool warm? The pool was a heated pool. Oh my! Yeah, it was. So, so that's that's Texas. So we kind of try to minimize the whole gift thing because it gets kind of out of control. I I am envious of that. I will tell you. Um, Fortunately, I have a couple daughters who are extremely organized. Mm. So they have managed to set up somehow a Google Doc. Okay, sure. Where you can put in your wish list of what you or your kids want, Mm -hmm. and then someone else can sign up to fill that slot, Mm -hmm. only you can't see everything on it. 
I'm right. not quite sure how this works. I don't participate, hmm. <laughs> although every year someone says, so, Dad, what do you want on your gift list? Mm-hmm. But However, I did solve my problem one time years ago. Dr. Webster was telling me what he does, and that is, I guess, a Chinese tradition that I had never mm-hmm. heard of, and maybe they do it for New Year's, I don't know, mm-hmm. the money tree. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> he would get a tree or a branch, mm-hmm. and then he would attach little envelopes with varying amounts of money. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you would, I guess they go in order of age, and you would pick an envelope not knowing, and it might have $5, might have $20, and so it was kind of this, you know, suspenseful, yeah. happy thing. <laughs> so I thought, ah, if I did that, then no one would ever be feeling bad that I didn't give them a card or a present or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, I tried it one year. I went out and got a a branch and I stuck it in a pot and I hung over it these little envelopes. It was pretty ugly, honestly. <laughs> but everyone liked the money. Yes. <laughs> and, of course, you know, since Webster was doing it, inflation has set in mm-hmm, big mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I would put in, you know, some dollar amounts, but then I might put in uh, a Kiva gift card. Oh, very nice. So yep. that someone oh. could, rather than getting money to spend, they could get money to give, loan and give. I love that, um, yeah. Heifer International, mm-hmm. uh, I, you can buy, a, you know, buy a goat for someone for mm-hmm. 45 bucks or something mm-hmm. I don't know and so yep that and then I usually put in like the grand prize mm-hmm. was a round trip airplane ticket anywhere in the domestic contiguous 48 states which I could get with miles so yes. it didn't cost me hundreds of dollars yes so as often as you travel you collect miles so for doing that that's now become a, a point of tradition and contention mm. How old do you have to be Mm. before you participate in the money tree? Oh, yeah. And, you know, then it's not fair because Mm. and the grandkids are all out of whack about it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) anyway, but that that uh, occupies me for a couple hours and that's the sum total of my shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think we probably touched on a few areas of our language arts and, you know, our arts of language. But there's so many more ideas. For example, you could write Christmas poems with mm-hmm. your children. Mm-hmm. Or you could ask everyone to prepare a toast. Mm, I like that, yeah. You know, and when you have a formal meal, Christmas yep. or maybe New Year's or whatever, everyone has to raise their mm-hmm. cup, whatever's in it, and uh, talk for a minute or something about someone and mm-hmm. give a toast. That's a nice thing to I do. I like that, yeah. We don't want our kids to grow up and, and then be asked to be a best man or a maid of honor at a wedding and, and stumble, stumble over, around miserably, yeah. which we have seen. Yes, <laughs> we have. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, even a, like a, a photo journal, yeah. you know, we take a lot of photographs, but what do they do? They just mm-hmm. sit in a camera or phone, mm-hmm. sit in a folder, sit in iPhoto or whatever. But if you took a few of those and made them into Unit 5 style writing yep. assignments, which yep. would be perfect for January because that's where you're supposed to be, Unit 5 writing from pictures. December, January. Yep. Yeah. So we're right in there. So there's some more thoughts. Yep. That's great. Well, that's good. You Now you've tied it all together. So, well, Merry Christmas, Andrew. All right. Well, I will say Merry Christmas to you when it is actually Christmas. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.